All right. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Um, this is another developer call, mostly focused on um, shell scripting and also the DevOps of how we work in uh, chaos. And um, it is mostly going not, it's mostly going to tackle um, just um, an overview of how everything happens and it's not like a tutorial. So um, for all those that like want to be new contributors to any of the projects in chaos, um, you could have chance to go through this video and see what works for you and what doesn't. But before we do that, there were two pending things we had to do. And number one, um, we had to introduce to the whole chaos community, the bot script um, folder, because it's uh, shell scripting is uh, closely tied with DevOps. So we thought we'd combine this call into that. Um, we thought we'd combine that overview into this call before we go to like how we how we manage um, the deployment of the different projects on chaos um, so uh, for those that were on the previous call um, I was sharing a few links here I'm just not sure whether those links were actually captured in the recording but for the purposes of those on the call um, we are going to have shared a link to the screen that I am sharing. And we're going to look at this particular repository. So if you can scroll to that link, which I can actually share here. So the repository that we're going to look at is this bot scripts. And what the bot scripts repository does is it has a shell script that, um, and this shell script was majorly made um, by me and some other people that have added in some other some other refinements to help people get started with with this uh, repository. Let me just open up another tab here so that I don't have to to switch between to to press the back button. So um, for those of you who have heard about the budging bot, uh, it's kind of uh, a hassle to get this bot up and running because there are a lot of things you have to connect. Number one, you have to have uh, <clears throat> a GitHub app on your personal account. And number two, you have to like set up uh, tokens so that the GitHub app can connect to your account. And number three, you have to fork uh, the events and diversity repository. If I can also just open that here. So like you have to fork this repository and uh, all that process of getting this up and running sometimes could be confusing or if it's like a documentation, well, it would work, but we were like, what if someone would just come and uh, copy just a command sorry, my copy just a command, which has all these um, automations and they guide them into installing that and getting them up and running without having the hassle to fork repositories, get tokens, again, um, look for the GitHub app and where to find it, things like that. So that was the main um, use of this shell script. And uh, if you if you could go to the, if you can, if you if you could copy this, our intention was if you could copy this and paste it into your terminal, doesn't matter which operating system you are using, whether Windows or a Linux machine or a Mac OS, it would automatically detect the operating system and install the necessary um, install the necessary dependencies for you and get you up and running. But well, um, since this was only tested on a Linux machine we found that there were some errors when someone runs the, the shell script on a Windows machine and also a Mac OS machine. And on some previous calls, we had met with some other 
developers who are interested in working on these scripts to test it on a Mac OS machine and also test it on a Windows machine so that um, they can make refinements to see what actually the problem was with the script. Um, we have not yet been successful with the Mac OS and Windows, and I had assigned those tasks to particular people, but up to now they're not responsive. I tried pinging them and I'm not sure what they're up to, but anyway, those are the hassles of open source. When someone is contributing and they're not like uh, paid, you can't pin them because they're just sacrificing part of their time to be available to work on the project. So um, I can't really say that if you copy that command and paste it in your terminal, if you're not using a Linux machine, I can't really say that it will work, but if it doesn't work, our major aim is if you find it that it, that it doesn't work and you can figure out how to um, edit this script and make it work without breaking things, good. We can have your pull request and merge it in here. And then number two, we were also looking at creating um, creating a workflow for testing those particular changes. So um, one idea I had just I suggested to the team that had earlier that had earlier um, wanted to work on this was um, if we could have some action, if we could have some GitHub actions here and uh, create and create runners for Mac OS, Linux, and Windows so that when any change happens in the script, we can test it here before we deploy it. So um, for now, that is still a work in progress and um, we have not yet had any successful contribution towards that. But in case, in case it happens and you can uh, test this script in a workflow file and the tests pass, we would be happy to match that for you here. Um, so what I want to focus on is just like how this, this script works and uh, what particular things um, um, it does. So if you look here, um, <clears throat> This script, this script I, I tried to comment it so that um, at least it's readable, but what the script does is um, it has a while loop, which turns to false in case any of these things are wrong. And um, the while loop is um, having if statements that check your system, if it is Linux, or it, if it is Darwin, Darwin is like Mac OS, or if it is um, CYG Win, um, this is like um, the terminal, this is what the terminal returns if you're using um, the Windows operating system. So for those of you who use Mac OS, <clears throat> I don't know why it's called Darwin, but that's what, that's what it is. And for Windows, this is what it's called. So for now, there are actually no, there are actually no developments completely for Windows. So if you're there and you're using Windows and would like to test this also, it will be good to do it and let us know how it um, works. I wouldn't support using um, the, um, is it called the Windows subsystem for Linux? Something like that, the WSL. It's a new feature in Windows that helps you have like um, a Linux machine on top of your Windows machine. But I would want someone to test this in a PowerShell or in the command prompt so that we make custom, so that we make custom commands for the Windows machine without using like WSL. I know it's a bit now getting old to use the Windows um, command prompt because of the WSL, but who would want to have that like in its raw format here. So um, this is something we've not yet implemented. I actually just commented uh, Windows is not yet supported because I didn't have where to test it from. I do not use a Windows machine. But once everything has been tested, like if you're using Linux, um, you, will be, you will be prompted to input in your password because everything that will be installed down here needs sudo access. And um, like uh, the installing curl, curl is used to install um, to install some packages down here, and also um, 
what we install is the GitHub Actions command line interface, which we use for cloning and can't I wrap these things? There is way. Like these lines are so long. Uh, something like line wrap. Oh, okay. I think it only works when um, you zoom out. But okay, if you scroll to this side, you will see um, what kind of um, what kind of dependencies and what kind of packages we install, like npm, GitHub, um, GitHub CLI, which is like um, the command line interface for for interacting with GitHub repositories. And then um, the last one that we install is Node.js. Yeah, I was looking for Node.js. And if you don't have Git, we also like automatically install Git for you. And um, if these are really installed, they will be skipped. So you don't need to worry like uh, you're going to break anything. And then after that, which is the same thing with uh, Mac OS, we install Git, um, GitHub, uh, CLI, Cal, Node, and NPM. Um, then the configurations start whereby um, we, 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 we would want to have you um, set your username and email to your GitHub, um, to your GitHub, to your GitHub configurations. But again, I realized that this was a double implementation because if someone already has their configuration set up, they, didn't, they don't need to go through this process. So um, I was talking with one of the contributors of this project and I was telling them if they can find a way to skip this, to detect whether the configurations are there and skip them instead of um, going through this process because sometimes you could actually make different configurations and mess up with your GitHub, with your Git information. So that is also another issue to solve, like um, to skip this in case the configurations are there. And then um, for those of you who have used GitHub CLI, um, in case you just issue this command, uh, GitHub auth login, if you're already authenticated using the GitHub CLI, it will skip it. But in case you're not, it will walk you through, um, I think it's almost like seven steps of authorizing your GitHub account to work with the GitHub CLI. And uh, all these commands, the, um, the repo fork, repo fork, they use GitHub CLI. So what happens here on this line is, uh, after authenticating, we clone the budging bot repository for you. And after clone, sorry, we fork it on your account if it is not forked and clone it automatically on your machine. So you should make sure that you're running this script like in your projects folder where you want these repositories to be forked. So the same thing happens. We also clone the we also fork the event and diversity and inclusion repository for you, but we do not clone it. Why? Because we only need the fork of it so that you connect to it online because we use it to test for the, we use it to test for the developments we are making in the budging board. And then after that, um, you will have to like create um, uh, environmental variables. One of them is the webhook URL. Um, another is the, okay, webhook secret. Another is the app ID, client ID. Another is a client secret, um, private key. Um, and all these are like the script will be guiding you into how to, where to place those and where to find them. But just to show you how those are got. In case you're interested in um, in finding those, you could easily just go to your settings and then scroll down and go to developer settings where you will find um, an option to create uh, a new GitHub app. For me, I already have two bots that I use. Actually, I put in the description here that um, this is a test bot for chaos budging. So you'll have to create your own personal um, bot for test purposes. And um, if when you create that bot, that's where you'll find the app ID, the client ID, you can be able to generate a new client secret and also uh, a webhook URL, which goes here, uh, sorry, or oh, it goes here. And then a webhook secret, which you can generate here on first try. So every time you create like a, 
client secret, you go and paste it in the terminal where you've been prompted to paste it. And uh, when you create like uh, also a webhook secret, you go and paste it there. Then when you save all these, um, you could even generate a private key, which you're asked for in the, in the setting up of the script. So um, in the end, um, when all those are being, when all those have been um, filled in, um, this script, this 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 script moves the .m file that was created and places it in your in your budging bot repository, so that um, when you run npm run dev, uh, the .m file is detected and it is run. Um, but these are like initial commands to set up Husky, which we use for linting, and also to install the packages, and then you can run the script. So that is what the script does in a nutshell. Uh, so far, right now, there are 156 lines. I'm sure they could be more, depending on uh, the pull requests that are open here, and also the issues that could be worked on. But um, in case in case you have like um, questions about the script, one, I would advise you to go line by line so that you understand what the script does in case it fails. Um, I put these so that um, the script can return for you readable errors, but um, some of them are so verbose. So I sometimes find like it, the script runs and it it is so wordy and verbose that sometimes you get lost into where the instructions are. I'm not sure how to tweak that so that um, you could have a clean um, execution in the terminal, but if someone can also figure that out, that would be good. Um, otherwise, that is it that this script does. And we hope we could use it for first time contributors who like want to contribute to the budging board for now and in the future. So the better it works, the better it is for first time contributors to find it easy to jump onto contributing to the budging project. Um, questions before I leave this alone and go to something else. I'm checking if there are hands here. Yep, Onyinye already has a hand. Um, yes, and also what you could let me first have um, Onyinye. Um, so if we want to contribute, like say do the test or for the Mac, we just need to raise the PR rights or is there any process before that? If you want to contribute to what particularly? Um, some of the issues you raised here, like um, verifying the this install script on for Mac and Windows. Yeah. Like, if you want to do any of that, do you just raise a PR or is there some procedure first? Yeah, you, uh, um, the standard procedure is just raise a PR with the fix that you created and. I, I could not be able to test it. And that's why, and that's why actually I was um, suggesting to the contributors that if we can create some workflow that tests this script on the three operating systems, it could even be using Docker containers or we could use runners if GitHub provides runners for those different operating systems. It would be good because now, if you are making a change on, on uh, a Mac OS implementation and you upload it, if it's not tested, there is no way I can tell whether it runs successfully or not. So um, the standard procedure is create a PR and um, if it is tested and it works, we merge it. Okay, cool. Does that yeah, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering, like, how, what if someone is already doing what you're trying to do? Like, are there instances where that happens? Yep. Yeah, so, um, generally, also in um, like open source, if um, someone is already working on something, maybe like um, the, 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 the contribution, or oh, someone is dropping something. Hold on.
sorry guys um if generally on the contribution cycle of open source is um if you realize there is an issue that you'd want to work on um if it is not like in the issues you can open it up and then maybe ask to be assigned and then um it is always wise not to start working on an issue before like you contact the maintainer because sometimes you could spend time working on an issue that is already being tackled by someone so um before maybe you can work on an issue it's good to first ask the maintainer if you're not seeing the issue assigned to someone or if you're not seeing it anywhere but if you see an issue has already been assigned to someone maybe most times someone is working on it but if it's not there it would be good like to first ping the maintainer to know whether someone is working on it so that you do not really waste time making a contribution a double contribution okay cool Cool. Thanks. All right. Um, let me have Emma first and then uh, Faith. Yeah. So the question I was asked by EH brought up answered part of my question. Um, I did. I just wanted to reiterate the fact that I did create some issues, and um, one issue is supposed to be assigned to me, but some of what you discussed in um, this in this general overview also have their issues as well. So I wanted to okay. know what's, okay. what's the, the process because I I did go through the route of working on something based on our community discussion, something rather than the economy. And I worked on something, I created a PR and PR is there, and I created the issue after the PR, but the issue was not existing, but we discussed around it about it. So um, for cases where we have a discussion, someone creates an issue after a PRO, which is obviously the reverse, um, is it preferable to um, have an issue created and deeply discussed around before the work starts um, subsequently? Or um, we just work based on the discussion we had, and when we are done with that, we can create the detailed issue and do the link mechanism, link the issue, make the PRO, and then we'll start trying to see how we can follow up. Then if if the first um if the first thought is correct, that means we might likely need to have a sort of um I would say contribution workflow for the bot scripts. I I think I don't know if it's just me. Yeah, there is no contribution .md here. I think that's where the confusion came from for my side. So my need to have a contribution that then so that if if we have a discussion in the meeting, we should create the issues before we create um, before we start working on it. And the issues should also be assigned to because there are quite some issues here that um get assigned. The only issue assigned is the one connected to it, but the other ones are unassigned, and some of them have been touched as well. So that was so okay. Yeah, thank you for that. I think, um, well, to 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 like just go into a smaller detail of the contribution process. Um, in chaos, we follow our we follow our I should say a loose contribution process. There are some issues that need discussion before they are actually worked on because um, you could bring it up and it wasn't like in the scope of things to work on or maybe it wasn't in the maintainers um, areas of interest and you need to like discuss about how you're going to implement or maybe whether it's necessary or whether the feature is necessary so um, on our on a standard contribution cycle when you open up an issue, it is it goes through what we call triage, whereby um, your issue reporting is weighed to know how of priority is it and um, what is the direction of implementation, who is best suited to work on it, because you could raise an issue, but you do not have the you do not have the the, the, the expertise to work on it, but well, you've realized it, or maybe you have you think you have the expertise, but then on the maintainer's side, they feel that the issue has a lot of um, a lot of um, changes inside or internally. So um, that's what we call the badge triage. That's what we call the triage. Um, we 
we follow that or not, depending on what the issue is. Sometimes the issue is already visible and needs solving, and you don't need to like uh, think about it. And sometimes when the maintainer has no, like didn't have a clue about the particular approach of a solution, and then you who has identified the issue, you have like a particular approach. So um, it is, um, it is, it is, it is kind of. Um, dependent on what issue it is. I can't say that there is one process we follow, but as long as you let the maintainer or as long as you create an issue and um, let the maintainer assign you, or as long as you do not start working on an issue before the maintainer knows that you're working on that issue, I think that would be like the standard um, first steps for our, our contributions here in Chaos. So I like for this issue that I opened up, I'm not sure whether it's this one that you're saying that I was supposed to assign to you. Was it this one? No, 16. Issue 16, huh? Yes, issue 16. Oh, okay. Um, uh, now like this one, I'm not sure. Had you already started working on it? Oh. What did I do? Had you yeah. already started working? Yeah. So like I, have. Uh, I created a PRO. I thought I did. What? Oh no. Yeah, this is the one that we hopped on the call once. We'll try and figure oh. out why people are working on the to twenty two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. I get. Um, if you could link the PRs to to, and actually that is also like um a feature that GitHub thought about, and uh, it's necessary that when you create an issue, a uh, pull request for an issue, you could link the 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 pull request here. I know um automatically GitHub um scans for where this issue has been has been um like mentioned and it brings it here but 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 um but sometimes when you go to when you go to the issue and add this on this other section um it will reflect better here in the comment section um but well like i said there is no we do not have like a tight contribution um cycle it depends on what we are actually solving for and um, what needs to be should let me call it the approach to the solution. Um, well, did Faith get tired of raising her hand? Faith, are you do you still have your question or it was answered along yeah, the discussion? I actually, okay, not just like a question, but just wanted to drop like an update so. Remember you mentioned like um, testing the different OSs. So yeah, yeah. like if the script works, yeah. So I've tested that on Windows and actually on the script, it shows that um, the stuff doesn't work on Windows. So I see that there's an issue open to configure the script to work on Windows. Um, uh, and actually that issue was for you. Okay, so I would yeah. actually start working on that. I've been like, it's been a lot lately. So, can you that. just comment here so that I can? Let me see. So, you can we assign can't. to me. Yeah, because GitHub usually doesn't, um, doesn't detect, doesn't, doesn't detect contributors if they have not had any interaction with the repository. I'll do that as soon as you comment. Um, is there any other thing? I'm not seeing any other hand and um, what? Time can fly. It, we're getting, uh, time is against us. We're like having less than 20 minutes. I should say 10 to be exact. So um, allow me just go through something about um, how we manage our how we manage our deployment. So um, just trying to make sure I'm not going to share any passwords and stuff. So before I share the tab, okay, no problem. 
Um, just turn off these notifications. Mike, check one, two. Are we still on? So I'm thinking in our group for most likely. I mean, if I just might. Okay. All right. Um. So um, in 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 digital ocean, and um, I'm I'm speaking in terms of digital ocean. There is there are different terms in the G in GCP that is Google Cloud Platform, Amazon Web Services, and also Kubernetes. So um, but for digital ocean, um. DigitalOcean has a lot of um, services. Um, you could create um, droplets, you could create apps, um, you can create like um, databases, and then you can also manage domains uh, because um, DigitalOcean helps you to like route to your domain name servers, which actually we did that. If you look under here, if you go to budging.cares.community, um, it was a, it was, it is a subdomain that the Linux Foundation created for us and um, we map it to this droplet. So um, DigitalOcean has like a lot of functionalities, but most times it is so easy to like set up and get you running because it is more focused. When you go to Amazon Web Services, it has a lot of functions and you could get lost in there if you do not know what has brought you in there. So, um, in, 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 in our deployments, we use what we call um, droplets. And a droplet is a term, I think it was, uh, should I call it uh, a branding term? Since this is like digital ocean, when you're in the ocean, there is water. And so they have what we call droplets. So droplets are like servers. Servers, um, you can set up um, a server. And uh, let me just see if I can do that right now. Um, so if you set up like a server, you can um, set up a Ubuntu server, Fedora, Debian, CentOS, Alma Linux, or a Rocky Linux server. And then you can also choose um, if it's a Ubuntu server, you can choose what version you want to have for that server. And then you can choose what kind of CPU you want to use on that server. or And then you can then choose depending on what your budget is, um, the specifications. The biggest being our 16 GB server, which has um, 16 gigs of, um, of Sorry, RAM. Sorry, Enoch, we can't see your screen. You can't see or you can see? We can't, we can't, we can't see your screen. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I'm sharing this, what happened? Oh. Sorry, guys. 
Um, okay, just figuring this out. Oh, sure. And now, I don't know what happened there. So I said they must make Zoom open source. Yes, we can. I can see. Sure. So um, if, 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 if you want to get familiar with DigitalOcean, and there are a lot of ways you can do that, um, you can deploy your code directly from GitHub. But how we do it for us is um, we create servers. So um, I was saying you could create any of these servers operating using these operating systems. And um, you could choose um, how, how the specifications of that server would look like depending on your budget. And um, I can't just create, okay, I won't create one for now, but let me do that. I will delete it. I hope I remember so that they do not chop our $7 at the end of the month. So um, when you create, when you create, when you create a droplet, I'm not going to create that. When you create a droplet, it will reflect, um, it will reflect here. So this was like um, a droplet. This is a droplet that manages our budging bot. It manages our uh, budging website. And also it manages the database that uh, we use to keep the budget repositories. So on this, um, on this, on the, on this particular droplet, um, how we do, how we access this droplet is in two ways. For those of you who use SSH, um, I want to share something else. I want to share a terminal. Okay, can you see my Tamino? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, let me just I clear that. So um how we how we access this server is um I mostly use SSH and I have I have um I, my user, I, ha I created my user on that server. So I can access it by saying SSH, um, my username, because I created one on the servers because I didn't want to use the root server. And then I can use um, the URL, the domain. Now, for those of you who know something about deployment is that um, every time you, map a domain name to our server. Um, on the internet, that domain name is translated. Um, the network will just hit into an IP address and to my digital ocean droplet that accessing, I'm not trying to look, okay, I have a lot of windows. Open. I'm trying to access the droplet, how that looks like. So if I open this up and I type in my password for my, so, um, this droplet, I'm looking for the IP address actually. Oh yeah, the IP address is here. So if you look here, um, if you look at what I've highlighted here, the 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 command is the SSH command translated the it translated this subdomain into this droplet. And to show you that that also works, um, I can exit here. And then um, I SSH, sorry, let me just clear this to make it, um, instead of using the domain name, I can just use the IP address because they're both, they're both the same. 
and I'm waiting for that to load. Hopefully I'm logging on to the right. Um... Oh, okay. I can see the issue here. Okay, this is not the right droplet. Um, it wasn't supposed to be that IP address. I just checked. It is supposed to be this. I don't know where I copied that from. But it was the wrong IP address. So how you know that I've logged on onto Oh, sorry, this IP address is for my machine. And it wasn't for the, and it wasn't for the, for the badging um, server. So how you know that I am logged onto the same server is, my server has the same name, whether I use the IP address or whether I use the subdomain. If you see, if you see, if you see this, it means that um, I am logged on onto the badging server. So um, on the badging website, sorry, on the on the on our servers, and I'm only using this one for like uh, demonstration purposes. Um, on our servers, we deploy the website um, using Nginx, and then we deploy the backends. We mostly deploy backends using Docker, and um, Right now, I have the budging bot running on a Docker. If I said Docker, oh, sorry. I'm, uh, looks like I'm logged onto a different server because this had to return. <laughs> this had to return something. Guys, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit confused on which server. I'm a little bit confused on which No. Um, Docker command not found showing that I'm on a wrong server. But anyway, let me just change this and use another server. Mm, for test purposes, uh, there is another server in open source.org. Okay. For test purposes, I just logged into another server just to the one I'm sure has um, what I want. So um, what happens is um, for the front end, um, if you do not know how to really set up uh, Nginx for front end, I'm going to share a link in the, actually, let me do it now, a link in the group. Um, I don't know why I like saying group. So um, I like DigitalOcean because it has really nice tutorials for how to set up a lot of uh, things. So let me share this in the chat here with you. If you don't know how to set up Nginx, I'm not going to really deal with the front end um, but if you want to know how we set up the server to run Nginx on front end, you could um, you could um, use the link I have sent in the chat. But um, so if, if 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 you look at this container here, it's a little bit disorganized. Let me just zoom out so that um, I can organize stuff. But if you can't see, I will zoom in. So we have like a container ID and we have an image. Its image is pulled from registry.digitalocean, registry.digitalocean slash project badging. And then um, we give it a name and also a share value, like a unique ID. Um, where we, what we do is um, we created a, uh, a container registry. At least every hosting um, platform has a container registry. And this container registry stores our Docker images. 
Docker images that we get when we build we build Docker images most times in the workflow files. For example, if I can just stop sharing this and share the Chrome tab again, so that I show you something. So what happens is, no, since I am using another, Okay, the internet is just deciding to become slow for its own reasons. But I'm trying to open up something else here in the screen I've shared. Okay. So, um, for example, um, the server I am interacting with actually is where we're deploying the back end of the project budging the project budging that we are trying to come up with. And if you look at the workflow files, these are mostly what we use to build, to build the Docker, the Docker images that like the one I've shown you there. So um, this workflow file has three jobs. One is a build job, one is a Docker build job, and one is a deploy job. So in the workflow file, uh, what happens is, um, this internet is becoming a mess. Okay. So what happens is in the workflow files is um, we target specific branches. This was, this is really redundant. I don't know why I've just seen that right now. And then we use a uh, digital ocean registry container registry that is um, on our digital ocean on our digital ocean um, account and to find the registries you can just come here to the left and go to container registry um, it will have it will have like um, the name of the registry which is this and then um, you can go to settings and find a token which you can use to connect like to this registry. So if I'm just go back to the workflow file and I hope I can end with this workflow file because time is against us. So what happens is we have a build job. This build job is actually supposed to make tests which we've not yet created. This is like really useless. NPM run format, linting code on production is useless. It's mostly about testing that we care about, but just that we've not yet created tests, test cases. I just put this as a placeholder just to have that job there. Um, anyway, in case there is also code that is not linted well, but um, We run, we run our job on uh, a Ubuntu machine, and this job only runs when there is a pull request that has been, um, so that I don't have to scroll. We run, we, we run the main repository. So actually that's what this line means. And what, 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 what happens is, um, um, we log into the digital ocean registry, the one that I've just shown you. And um, we use a runner that is called DOCTL. DOCTL is a digital ocean command line. Let me call it a command line uh, um, feature that helps you interact with your digital ocean account in the command line. And since these action scripts run like from the terminals, that's why we use DOCTL. So we use this runner and then we use a token that we accessed in the digital ocean settings. And um, all these access tokens are actually, if I show you where these access tokens can be found in case you're creating an access token for your, for your project, you could just go to, sorry, settings, Oops, what did I do? I 
I just want to show you, like, um, if I go to budging board and I go to settings here of the repository, I go to secrets and variables to actions here. And I can create environmental variables for my, I can create secrets for my repository. So these are the different secrets I have for only this budging board in that they help me in my workflow file that I don't need to like expose them publicly. They are in here. So I have my app, app ID, my URL, my client ID, client secret, my digital ocean access token, my passwords are in here, my host, my host IP addresses and also any other um secrets i may need and even if i click on these um like edit these uh you won't find them here because as soon as you save them they get saved somewhere on the github servers so they're safe inside there so anytime you're making like actions uh, or workflow files make sure that you make use of the make sure you make use of that secrets feature so um i stored those there and I access them by just using um, this command. Um, automatically, if you're running GitHub Actions, it automatically detects this and knows that you want to call something in the environmental variables that you stored on your particular repository. So um, what happens is when you log into DigitalOcean, it gives you access to DigitalOcean, but um, let me call it like um, it doesn't give you it doesn't, it doesn't permit you to access digital ocean for longer time unless you extend that time. And that's what we actually did here. So the login expires immediately, but we tweak the login to the registry to expire after 600 seconds because there are some things we want to do in the registry. And one, what do we do? We look for the image, the previous image, and we delete it because we do not want to have the container registry packed with a lot of um, containers that are not in use. We only want to have the container that is current and that is in use at that particular time. And after that, we push, after deleting the previous repository, we build a new one um, and then we push it to replace the repository that we deleted. And if I can, if you if you remember in the terminal, something that I showed you that was an image name, this is how the image name is created. Um, we have the registry name, which we use, and we slash it with the image name, which are both are here. So it could be like registry.digitalocean.com slash project badging slash badging. And then we use a GitHub sha value um, this is like the um, this is like the unique name that is given to that latest commit that is on that is on the that is on the branch that you're pushing. So it is always unique. That's why we use it because we do not want to confuse the containers. And then once we have deleted the previous repository and pushed a new repository, we then deploy that container. And how would, how do we do it? Um, as soon as you make a pull request to the main to the main to the main branch, Docker will build this. And as soon as the merge is made, what happens is um, this 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 like shows um, merging to the main branch. So as soon as GitHub detects that there is a merge to the main branch, it will deploy that updated um, code on the main branch. So it will log in into the registry to give us access to that container that we pushed there. And then it will log in into our droplet using the, we use um, our a GitHub runner, which is like SSH action. It helps us to log into our, our droplet using SSH the way I did in the terminal, but this time around doing it in the, doing it on GitHub. So we use we use the IP address plus the username and your password, and then we log into that droplet or your server, and then we check whether there is any running container, which right now there is a running container. So when we find that container using an image name, we stop it and remove it because we do not want to keep containers inside there.
because we do not want to waste space. So when we stop it and remove it, we deploy a new container from the registry under this line here. So what we do, we log in again uh, into the server and then we pull the container from the registry. We already logged in up here, so we do not need like to log in again. And that logging in helps us access the registry. So we pull this particular image. Uh, that image was created up here. So it won't confuse the images. And most times there is only one image, though sometimes during test purposes, you find that there is more than one image, but most times it's only one image. And then um, just to be sure that we've pulled that, we've pulled the right image. We just echo to print out the image name here, and then we run it. We run, we run, we run the Docker container that we pulled, and we expose the port that the API that the front end is supposed to communicate with with the back end. Um, it's really a random port that we use and we expose the container using this port to the outside world. And then we have like a list of environmental variables that we have on the server that are for different test cases. Sometimes we have, um, we have different files that we use for environment variables we use for production. We have different environmental variables we use for testing and also for development purposes. That's if we are working with the server online. So depending on what file we have, we shall call that file during the running of the Docker container. And this line is just like um, in case I shut down my server and um, restart it, the Docker container should restart on restarting the server. Yeah, and um, lastly, we give a name to that Docker container that is running which actually here is always detected when there is a new image that is going to be that is going to be pulled and run. Um, that is the, what we detect for, and we delete it before um, running a new Docker container. So um, this process that I've gone through happens for right now we're using it for like three projects. I know there are very many other processes that could be used for deployment purposes. Um, sometimes even there are very many different ways we can um, we can manage um, containers if the API is really so huge and um, we need to optimize. There are different workflows to create for that. But for now, this is like the basic, the immediate workflow, the one we always start with when we are running any chaos project that needs to be deployed on a server. Yeah. So um, I think I've gone through this whole workflow file and almost where everything lives, just to get your brains interested in this. In case there is um, development you need to make around deployment. Um, let me get questions. But before we get the questions, um, we do not pay for SSL certificates. Um, because SSL certificates are free unless you really want to spend on them. But for every subdomain we create to deploy it on a new, to create, to create, to deploy um, that subdomain or to attach it to a project on a new server, we use what we call, um, let me share it here. We use what we call Let's Encrypt. And what Let's Encrypt does is it creates an SSL certificate for you on your machine that is free, that you do not need to pay for. So every time we create a new subdomain, we just come here and generate, we install, we install this on our server. In case we're using Nginx and we're using Ubuntu, um, there is really a guided process on how to install an SSL certificate onto your server so that um, it is secured. Um, you can follow through, I think I can send this. Let me send this into the chat. Otherwise, I would want to stop there for purposes of time. We could go through the details of very many things, but um, I'm just sharing basic things of how we do everything at least 
by start. Um, do we have questions or confusion or um, additions onto that before we close the call? Because we are a few minutes into another time. There are no hands. Oh, yeah. Yes. Please go on, Onye. I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's fine. Um, I think I'm just curious about, are there like, how do you know where there are the kind of contributions we can make here? Like, I think I largely get your explanations, but I, I don't think I'm sure, you know, how. Okay. Or, yeah. So um, mostly I made this call, um, one, because um, I wanted to make this whole flow process so public for maintenance purposes, both now and in future. So just like to get people familiar with how um, the workflow of uh, deployment works. And two, um, you could find sometimes that um, we want to maybe have a new project or a new or a new website or a new let me let me say a project so like um, it's it shouldn't always be one person to do that yet we have a lot of developers on here so if you know like our basic workflow it helps you to like give advice on to what to do or on to what to tweak so that um, we can maybe assign you that role of um, managing the DevOps side. So it, it wasn't mostly for purposes of finding issues, but it was purposes of making this knowledge public for future maintainers or for people who may find that um, there are some things that actually could be made better on the way we make our deployments. So yeah. Is that like satisfactory? Does that answer some of your queries? Yeah, yeah, it does. Cool. Um, any other? All right. Looks like either I've spoken too much or people have gotten lost or they have understood or they're like not interested in this particular topic. But otherwise, um, uh, I hope I have explained um, I hope like I've explained well. <laughs> At least I hope I've not confused any of you. Um, uh, I should say see you all on Tuesday. Well, we have like um, sessions to speak about particular contributions by different people on the different projects and um, see you around on Slack too. Otherwise, have a good weekend ahead to everyone. Thanks for coming. This call will be will be uploaded. And um, I hope it's useful to either you or to the people that may meet it in the future. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you too for attending.